So, and now uh, I would like to invite um, Edward Jacobs. Yes, Edward yeah, is here. So, and he will present the Birnbaum Group designing the new Jewish Memorial Museum in Skopje. So, yeah. So, no, stop down here. Okay, yeah. We got microphone either. Is this on? It wasn't on before. I'm sorry that I can't do this in Russian. Okay, um, what I'm going to try to present to you very, I'm going to go quickly because I, I'm going to go quickly because it's a lot of pictures. So you get to see one of the things that we spoke about this morning was if we understand that in many of the post communist countries, educational systems within the formal educational system of the particular country. Unlike what we have in the age children and young people, and then any tourists that happen to come to Macedonia. Um, so they developed this museum. They did actually in the old Jewish ghetto of Skopje. There are, th there are now two and a half buildings there. There's one that is the Memorial Museum. There's another one that from the Jewish community that's being built. And a third building that's being built. And this is all in the area where a cultural renaissance is happening. National theater, the National Opera, the courthouse is all now um, under final construction and actually being utilized in the same area. This is a picture of the museum itself. Fortunately, they called us after they had built the, bu they'd built the building and designed most Interior, which became very difficult because we had to make certain architectural changes on the inside. Dedicated on March 10th, 2011, 68 years after the Macedonian Jews were deported to Treblinka. You see here a picture of Andrew Baker from the American Jewish Council and three soldiers holding urns of ashes from Treblinka. We'll get to that in a minute. One from each of the three major cities of Macedonia. Skopje, Shtip, and Bitolov, or formerly known as Monastir. Um, this is what it looked like when I got there. It's what I want you to see here. What's interesting to see here is they, in the design of them, I mean, it's, they, they, had, they had this huge gaping, I mean, as big as this room, that was open from top to bottom because they thought the memorial would go into that space. They envisioned some kind of sculpture that would go from the floor up to the, this goes three and a half stories, all the way up to the skylight and the ceiling. So the first thing that I had to do was close this up, half of, more than half of it, about two thirds of it. Um, same thing on the outside, we did tremendous amount of building, building changes which they were not happy about, but it was for the betterment of putting in an exhibition. Again, this is what happens when architects who had never done a museum and they didn't consult any museum specialists, they laid out this building. Um, good intentions, but anyway, the, the building itself actually turned out okay. We, were ma we managed to fix 
most of everything that had to be done. One of the first thing that they needed was the entrance area, which is about as big as this room, to be a commemoration area. What is the difference between commemoration and memorialization? Interesting question, which I can't get into now. But the commemoration area is something when you walk into this museum, you want immediately to be struck by something very, very powerful and very visceral and very literal. Different with a memorial that can be more abstract. So, um, I don't know if any of you recognize this picture, or pictures, many pictures like this. I'll show you some more um, right here. Um, I happened to be in New York at 9-11 when the towers came crashing down. And I was going around the city taking pictures and drawing people. You know, during that first week, people were walking around. Every time somebody would come with a camera, they'd be holding up pictures. And you'd have groups of people holding up pictures and holding, just standing, holding pictures. If anybody had seen my loved ones, if there were survivors, it turns out one of our colleagues at Yale, who's head of the Genocide Commission, Ben Kiernan, who works with us on many of our projects and gives us postdoctoral students when we need researchers, he started pulling out pictures from the Armenian genocide of the same type of thing. So you had hands and pictures, people. So you had their faces, you had pictures of the victims, all of this in one kind of tapestry. So what we decided to create for, the, for this area, here's one of the sketches that I did. Again, there was this notion, there was something haunting about these hands and the pictures. And this is the, this is the uh, uh, commemoration area that we created. These steel sculptures that were laser cut and then painted by me and a group of artists so that you have these scenes. You'll see close up of these scenes where you can see, again, here, here you see actually pictures of the victims because in Macedonia we have pictures of half of the victims of the Macedonian Holocaust. Half of them, we know all of their names, but we have pictures of half of them. But you can see, if you can see the resolution isn't so good, again, there are characters behind them that are actually holding the pictures. So it becomes a very, very powerful thing. By the way, the frames, 25% uh, of the frames are digital so that they flip different images. The rest of the, the other, let's say, 60% of the frames are actual pictures. And then some of the frames are actually empty. And some of the flame frames are mirrors. So that you actually, you walk by the sculpture, you see all of these faces. You see the faces of the murdered. You see the faces of the people who are looking for the murdered. And then you can also see yourself, because there's so much reflection which again, this whole notion of my relationship with commemoration, memorialization, and how that works, um, which is something that becomes a very effective mechanism. Um, it's a very powerful entrance. Uh, it, this is the sculpture. Now, the next thing that they wanted then was to do something with this huge three and a half, four story pit in the middle of the building that was supposed to be for a memorial. I guess they thought it was gonna be they knew that there was some, um, a male sculptor was going to come in and do some, you know, that's what male sculptors do. They make big sculptures from the ground and go up into the sky. I looked at this space, and since it's something that's viewed, because you walk around the museum and the exhibitions are around the museum, I wanted to hang something down from the skylight. The other thing is, since this is a memorial, so the, the approach has to be different. So what we did, here is a, you can see, Right here, this is just obviously an architectural drawing. This is the scope of the space. And the exhibitions are all the way around. So you actually walk around this, and it's always visible. The memorial itself is always visible. So what we decided to do was we wanted to come up with some universal theme, some universal biblical theme. Don't forget, we're dealing in religious countries. It's very interesting, not unlike what I'm doing in Texas, in the Bible Belt in America. This religious theme we took from the Old Testament, where Moses is confronted with a burning bush. Moses is confronted with a burning bush. It's the first time he meets God. And what's interesting about this picture is, is that the bush was burning, but it was not consumed by the fire. This picture of survival from a community of tens of people who are left, tens of Jews, who were left from this community after the entire community was wiped out desiring to create this memorial museum, I felt, and with the client obviously after suggesting this, this would be a powerful universal theme that while, while, while burned, while burning, 
the bush was not consumed. The community is still there. So we came up with an idea to actually construct 7,144 individual strands of beads, each that are 12 meters long. Okay, one, each one is different, every single one. And that when hung together, they would form, when hung together, they would form this picture here. I'll just take it back just for a second. They would form this picture. This is an animation we did of this burning bush inside. And, as you, and it's made with glass beads. So of course, the light is pouring in from the skylight. As you walk around it, the image is dancing from, from within. And this you see all the way through the entire exhibition. Um, here you see some, again, without walking around it, it's very difficult to appreciate exactly what's going on because it's a very powerful visual effect because every time you move, it becomes something different even though it's a static element. And of course, written in Macedonian, Hebrew, and uh, in, in Cyrillic as well is the word remember, zachol, remember, English, Hebrew, and Macedonian. Uh, this is actually was made in three different places. One of the places it was made, the beads were actually stranded in China uh, to get, seven, again, 7,144 separate beads. There are hundreds of millions of glass beads. No strand is, this, is different. By the way, one of the things that we're doing for the museum is, is we making uh, bracelets. For those of you who visited the museum, what you take home with you is a bracelet that is made from the same beads that come from the memorial, i.e. some palpable physical connection. A, that I was there, and B, that I understand this notion, I spoke about this earlier, individuality, rescue the individual from anonymity, the Aaron Appelfeld uh, commandment that we must do, and that's what this memorial seeks to do. How much time do I have left? Just so that you see, you know, that's me, by the way. I mean, this thing was, this is, this is a huge piece. Um, okay, um, then what we did, of course, when you walk into any kind of museum, what you want, we, 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 deter we feel that it's very necessary that you have a, uh, an orientation area. You know, young people get off the bus, I don't know what they were, first you gotta get them to turn off their phones, put them away, forget about what happened last night and how bad they feel and how hungover they are and introduce them that to a new experience and that something is going to happen here. Forget about everything that happened. Relinquish yourself to a, what's about to happen. This is an important story. We do this in, this in, in, in an orientation area. You can see this is glass. You can partially see through it. It's again, it's that same theme of holding up the pictures of the identity of the people. These are blank. It's up to you to fill them in. Who are these people? Who were they? Fill in their stories. We made a uh, custom movie. Michael Berenbaum, my partner and mentor, has won an Academy Award documentaries for what he's done. Uh, David knows this nodding, you know, fabulous uh, a filmmaker. And so we make a custom film here, which gives a 12 to 15 minute orientation and really makes this transition from the street into the rest of this museal exhibition, which is extremely important transitions, people. You ha for a museum, a history museum, okay? Right, the word, my friends, the word museum and mausoleum are not by accident related. Now there's good things about a mausoleum and there's bad things. The bad thing is it's like a grave and it's boring. The good thing is, is it's the repository of my culture. We, that is why we, we have to be stimulating. That doesn't mean we have to pander to technology. One can be stimulating, one can be interesting without everything being a screen and virtual reality. Okay, five minutes. Uh, we have an original train car that actually everybody walks through, an actual train car. As anybody who's been in Washington, Texas, you, you realize this is a very powerful experience when people get to walk through a boxcar. Um, these are the three urns I told you about. Kajimez, you're all familiar from, particularly in Eastern Europe, this whole notion of taking gravestones and making memorial walls. Very powerful, organic kind of memorialization. We're creating a space, we've created a space inside the museum where the urns are, and these current walls are actually going to be faced with the remnants of the gravestones from the Macedonian community. That's something that's going on right now. Um, for everything that you just saw, we won the prize, the, the uh, 2012 
Macedonian architectural biennality, biennale for uh, interior architectural creation without having done the exhibitions. The exhibitions were just finished. They were, they were sent out to international tender. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fly through this because I want, you to, I want you to understand the kinds of how we're now trying to relate to a local population about they know nothing, not about Jews, not about Judaism, not about Jewish history. So we start them as they walk up the stairs after this, in, in this uh, orientation. They walk up the stairs. There's a timeline on the stairs. On the timeline, they, they meet Abraham the patriarch, which, of course, they know from their biblical studies. Alexander, of course, in Macedonia. How could you do anything with Alexander? And we have a special exhibition on Alexander. Alexander and the Jews. You know how prominent Alexander is in the Talmud. Why are there so many Jews named Alex, Alexander, Sender, and Sander? I don't know if that's the case here, but there are. Um, of course, the birth of Jesus. Uh, of course, the burning of the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, the, the Bastille, the French Revolution. I mean, we go all through history, the Holocaust, the state of Israel, and of course, the state of Macedonia. Um, then when we get into the permanent exhibition, the first thing that we do is Stoby. I asked, that's what I asked you. Did we have an answer? I asked if there was a place in here in Latvia that was like what, we ha like what they have in Macedonia. From Roman antiquity, we have the presence of Jews. We have ancient Roman city that had two synagogues in it. So the f and nobody knows this. So of course, the first thing that we do is we bring the people up chronologically and say, the Jews were in Macedonia from this time. Look at what this was. And there's even, there are even uh, inscriptions on stones from the Jews who made the synagogues and how they lived at that time, the substantiation of Jewish presence. And then we designed the entire exhibition as a redo of this ancient town, of this ancient town, Stobi. Um, and, and we give a cor crash course on Judaism 101. You're in a synagogue. What happens in a synagogue? What do Jews do in a synagogue? How is that different from a church? Okay. Uh, span it, we go, oops, forward. We go, of course, because all of the Jews in Macedonia, eventually after they left, they were in Spain, the golden age of Spain, an incredible time. The Spanish expulsion, of course, a trauma that until the Holocaust was unparalleled and unequaled. Perhaps today we still, we're still even contending with parts of that. The Ottoman Empire, when we're thrown out of Spain, Bayezid II said to the Jews, come Come to, come to the Ottoman Empire, which we did with a printing press, which revolutionized, of course, the Ottoman Empire, among other things. Um, Ladino culture, which some of you are familiar with, very important. And then we go back to Skopje, to the Jewish quarter. And by the way, here we are when we get back there in the museum. We're at the corner of the museum that's a huge curtain wall of glass looking over the ancient looking over the ghetto of Skopje. So what we did was we just put on the glass so you could see right through it a transparent picture of what it looked like then. And you're actually looking now at modern Skopje as you're seeing the ancient and what happened at the end of the, the turn of the last century. Of course, Yugoslavia, the kingdom of Yugoslavia, what that meant. We go through all of the communities. And then Nazi rise to power, which is a, a film, Bulgarian occupation, incredibly important Bulgarian occupation. Because we have, to, here we get to deal, you know the story, right? Somehow, none of the, the Jews in Bulgaria are saved. The Bulgarians, in fact, come into Macedonia and help murder all of the Macedonian Jews. Why, how did that happen? We talk about the Bulgarian occupation also for the, for the Macedonians. This is, becomes, again, as, as was said this morning, becomes incredibly important. We're not mitigating, negating, or minimizing but we are presenting both the Macedonian bystander. We have to present. There was. We have to present this subject always. And then, of course, we speak about righteous of the nations. Interesting that you're still using that terminology. Michael Berenbaum, my mentor and partner, is very instrumental in saying we shouldn't say that anymore. We use the term rescuers. We don't use the term righteous of the nations. And do you know why we don't use that term? Why should we set them so apart? You know what happens when you ask the altruistic personality, why did you do that? Weren't you afraid? Why did you do that? What do they say? Nine times out of 10, what do they say? I don't understand your question. How could I act any differently? 
That's the lesson that we have to imbue in our viewers and in our students. Righteous among the nations. Righteous among our, we should all be those things. We should all be rescuers. In America, sometimes they use the term upstanders as opposed to bystanders. Very interesting. Bishop Cyril, of course, Bulgaria, the lawyers' union. The, uh, the Bulgarian story is something that's so profoundly important to understand. We go into the, the hell of Monopole, the cigarette factory turned into a, this is where I'll end, turned into a concentration camp for two weeks. This was a void in the museum that's the height of the memorial. It's three and four, four stories high. They, they weren't going to use it in the museum. I said, this is the best place for the museum. And what we've done is, remember I told you this morning, when we go to Auschwitz, looking at a pile of suitcases shouldn't say anything to us. Looking at one suitcase should say something to us. You walk down these stairs into the monopole, into the cigarette factory, and above your head as you walk downstairs, hundreds of suitcases, a cloud, a tornado from this deportation, are above you as you walk down. 20% of them are open. Coming out of them are the possessions, the makeup, the picture. 12 kilo, two hours, rouse, you have to leave. What do you take with you? What's really important in your life? You see the most astounding things that are coming out of these suitcases. These are what help us to, uh, to humanize and rescue the victim from anonymity. Um, of course, final solution, I'm not going to go into that now. You'll all have to come to the museum. Rescuers and partisans, the Macedonian partisans, Jews fighting with the Macedonians. Again, the universal implications of that, how incredibly important this is. It relates to the locals' legacy of the Holocaust. And of course, again, we come back to at the very end, we finish our journey through this. Have you identified, because we have people, we have testimony, we have actual stories. Do you leave this museum student? with the identity of someone that you could relate to. And if so, then we've profoundly fulfilled this command to remember. Thank you very much. So please, any questions? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. I think everybody now wants to visit this memorial after your uh, presentation. And I have uh, two questions, if I could, uh, to ask. Uh, first of all, I had experience to have studies at Yad Vashem studies, uh, at Yad Vashem, at Battle Lohamea Etawot in Israel. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's element of Israeli memorial uh, places dedicated to the Holocaust. Uh, it's important uh, element is um, so-called Yat Yelet. It's a place dedicated to now children killed during the Holocaust. Yeah, no, it's Bet Lohamaya Tawot, Yad Vashem, it exists. So, uh, do you have such uh, department or room dedicated to ch children se separate in your memorial? And the second question is about languages. Uh, because I know in Israel, um, you know, they tried you know, to provide uh, as much as possible languages, uh, excursions, and uh, they also tried to provide excursions in Arabic. They tried to find guides, uh, Arabs, who, who can do it, you know, actually, but they couldn't do it. Uh, so my question, uh, do you have uh, guides which provide excursions in Arabic language in your uh, memorial? Thank you. Yes, good. Two fabulous questions. The only reason, <laughs> the children's exhibition. We never do a museum, ever, without having a children's museum. Michael talks about the experience that he had at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. You're, many of you are familiar with Daniel's story. Daniel's story was the, you walk through the life of this young man named Daniel from the time that he was a young boy and everything, he had no idea of anything but birds singing and the sun rising and playing and going to school to going through the Holocaust. What was the problem with Daniel's story? The problem with Daniel's story, my friends, was that it was fiction. It was an amalgam. They made him up. Now, David is going to tell you how seriously 
it wasn't evil, but it was so profoundly mistaken. Oh, I'm sorry. You don't really have a real child whose story you can tell. We have to make one up. Does that say anything about the Holocaust? And are any of these stories really real? This is the intersection of politics, real politic, politics, and trying to get a museum built. What we do is we find the story of someone in the community and we make that story to an age appropriate level 10, 11, 12, 13. In this case in Macedonia, there's an entire, we just didn't have time, there's an entire, I would do the whole presentation just on this. There's an entire floor dedicated to the children's exhibition. Itzhak Adizes, a beautiful little boy, six years old in Macedonia, whose family had Spanish passports because they came from Spain. Spain and Hitler together. They were taken to Monopole because they had Spanish passports. One of the eight to 12 people allowed to leave escaped to Monopole. So listen what we have, a beautiful boy. We walk into his bedroom. In the exhibition, we walk into his room and we hear all about Macedonia. We hear about his childhood. The war comes. What's going on around him? We take him through the streets as war has happened. He's deported to Monopole, the cigarette factory that used just to be a factory in his neighborhood. He runs away in a covered wagon and ends up hiding out in a monastery and becomes Christian, adopts an identity, falls in love with an Italian girl. The Nazis march into Schodra. He leaves to Albania and lives with a Muslim family. Do you understand? I wish I could do this everywhere, this story. A Muslim family. The Jew is hidden by a Muslim family for two years until he's liberated. Goes back to Macedonia, nothing left, all his property taken, strangers living in his house. Goes to Belgrade to live with an uncle and then is taken to Israel where he becomes an officer in the army until he gets accepted to Columbia University where he sleeps in a car for six months because he didn't have enough money to stay in a dormitory until he got a scholarship. The last picture is him getting the medal from President Bush on Ellis Island, Statue of Liberty, the Presidential Medal of Freedom for Contributions of Immigrants to the United States of America because Yitzhak Adizes is today one of the most prominent conflict resolution manage, managers in, co in the corporate world. That's his story. That's how we're dealing with this wonderful question so that the children see what can you do and how do you overcome adversity and what do you become? How productive can you be? One, two. This is a short answer. Yes, guides. Most museums that we do, we prefer to have guides that we train. No alienating Walkman earphones. I'll walk through and press my button, click, click, with no interaction. We want a museum that has noise, that has life, that you hear other people. Within reason, of course, we have to be very careful how we design that. But of course we want to have docents, because then you train docents, you have a whole other level of education and people who can spread the word. And should they be of, of varying nationalities? Absolutely. That is always our preference. Great questions. Okay, it's lunchtime or something, we have to go. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. So now we have finished our first, uh, our second session, part one. And now we have lunch break. We will start the work uh, at Three o'clock, and our uh, next session will be uh, will take place here and on the second floor. But on the second floor, there will be only in Russian, no in uh, translation. У нас сейчас значит перерыв на обед. После обеда мы встречаемся в три часа. Сессии пройдут в этом же зале и этажом.